Hi everyone, today I want to go over a very strange interaction uh, that Simon and I discovered when we were sort of looking at something unrelated a few weeks ago, uh, but, but I, I'm, I'm sort of astounded that this kind of thing exists in GHC. Uh, so let's, let's dive in. It is all centers around the monomorphism restriction. So we can see some code here. Um, and it, it turns out that actually the way that, that HLS uh, runs code, it uses deferred type errors and actually sort of is, it, it changes the way things operate. So I'm, I turned off HLS, which is working just fine on my machine right now. Um, uh, but we're, we're exploring the dark corners. And so it, it's, it's actually gonna be clearer if we just use GHCI as I've set up down here. Uh, and so I'm going to walk through the code, and then we're going to see there's a very surprising thing that happens. Um, so here, um, the, my only extension is flexible instances. This is not one of my usual things where I have to have 50 extensions up at the top. Um, and I'm actually operating here in GHC 8107. Uh, so there's this is before GHC 2021, so it's really just flexible instances. Um, I make a class C with a rather innocent looking method. Um, and then I have an instance of that class, and this is where I need flexible instances that just says that I have an instance for when, uh, uh, as long as the argument to my method here is an int tupled with something else. Okay, that's, that, that's all well and good. Then I set x equal to five, why not? So this is already the first place where this thing called the monomorphism restriction happens, which I'll write in code as MR, because it's quite long. Um, so what the what the monomorphism restriction is, is that it says when I have a definition that looks like this, where the left-hand side does not look function-like, right? So this x does not look like a function. If I said x underscore, well, now x looks like a function. The MR doesn't happen. Um, if I have some other argument in here, uh, the MR won't happen. But if I just have a plain old x on the left, then the MR is in play. And when I have no type signature for x, um, so uh, uh, left-hand side does not look like a function. No type signature. Uh, there's a few other technical things, but this is the good. This is a good summary. We're going to get this monomorphism restriction, and what it means is that GHC will not infer a constrained type for X. So what do I mean by that? Well, X because Haskell supports overloaded numbers. X here could have the type num a arrow a. That's a perfectly good type for X. And I can even show you if I reload my module. Oh, something strange happens. Let's not worry about that right now. Um, uh, but this this can work. This is a valid type for X. If I, let me just prove that by commenting out the rest of the file here and then reloading. And we can really see it is just fine. Um, OK. But I actually want the monomorphism restriction to happen. So let's just even see in something as simple as x equals 5, well, what, what does GHC do? So it, it compiles, but what type does x have? It has type integer. Um, not int, not double, not float, although it could have any of those types. But GHC chooses integer. And the reason it does that is because when we compile a file and at the end of compiling, there's nothing to tell us what something like X should be, there's a defaulting mechanism. Um, and this is actually user controllable. So there's a, 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 no one ever really does this, but you can write default in a Haskell file. And then in these parentheses, you can list a bunch of types to try in succession. So if I wrote default double then float, and now I reload my file and I ask for the type of X, it's going to be double because double satisfies all of the requirements that we have on X, which is just that it be a number. Um, but if I put something else in here that uh, like bool, um, I could put that there. So now it's, oh, the default type bool is not an instance of num. Oh, uh, I'm surprised it didn't, it didn't, it shouldn't need to be an instance of num. Uh, extended default rules. Aha, that it should have probably told me that in the error message. Um, but now it tries bool and bool isn't gonna work out and then it goes to double. And so indeed, if I ask, whoops, if I ask for the type of X, we get double. Um, but th this turned out not to be the interesting thing. Um, uh, yet I thought maybe while we're learning about the monomorphism restriction, it's good to know about this default declaration, which no one ever really uses. Okay, so X gets defaulted to this type integer in this case. But actually, actually, if down here I say that x2, now I've given a type signature to x2, and I said that x2 equals x plus 1, now if I reload my file, now if I ask for the type of x, it's int. 
And that's because this defaulting happens at the very end of type checking. We're going to examine the entire file, figure out all of the constraints involved, and then say, oh, this X here, I don't know what type it should be. I know it should be a number, but I don't know what number. Well, after we see the int, now I know X should be an int. And indeed, when we, when we ask for the type of X, it's an int. Um, right. So those of you who aren't sure about this, if in, if in fact x were an integer, then this program would fail to type check because int and integer are different types. Um, integer is is unbounded. It can it can it can represent any um, mathematical integer, whereas int is is bounded. It only has um, 64 bits. Um, okay. So that's that's what's going on here. But then we do something slightly strange. So we're going to say that there's this function g. And I've written g in a slightly strange way. Instead of saying gy equals method xy, you might guess that I want the monomorphism restriction to, to happen here. And so, well, what's going to happen as we're trying to understand g? First, let's, let's try to recompile. Everything is good here. Um, but instead of just asking ghc, let's see if we can figure out what type g might get. Um, so, well, G has to have some type. So I'm going to use, I'm going to follow sort of the way that GHC does type inference. I'm going to use Greek letters to denote what are called the unification variables. Um, and these are types that we don't know yet. So G, after I look at its right-hand side, it's going to have, it takes some argument, which I don't know what type that's going to have. So it's going to be something alpha to, well, what does method return? Um, method returns when it's called, whatever it's called with, it's going to return unit. So G definitely has type alpha arrow unit for some type alpha. But also when we're type checking G, we see that there is a constraint. There's going to be a constraint on, um, well, on the type of this thing that's passed into method. So we're going to say that this is going to be a C constraint because method is in the C type class. Um, and then so we get a constraint that we need to solve C um, of, oh, well, what's the type of x? Let's say x has type beta. We haven't figured it out what it is. And we know, but we know that beta has to be a num. Um, but here we get a wanted constraint for beta and alpha. At this point, that's sort of as far as we've gotten. And I said a few minutes ago that the monomorphism restriction says that G can't have a constrained type. So we might imagine doing something like this, that G might have some type for all A, uh, as long as C beta A holds, then this will take, what did we say, A to unit. Um, it could, we could imagine some type like this for G, where we still haven't figured out what beta is, but later we will, um, and that's all well and good, and, and then now we can infer the type for G. But look, this type for G has this constraint. We need to satisfy it. If we assume it in the type of G, like I've done here, then all would be well. But the monomorphism restriction says, says no to that type because it's constrained. And the monomorphism restriction goes further and says, well, if we can't put a constraint there, then this A here, we can't quantify over A. We can't say that this is for all A. So instead, the MR says that G has to have type, well, alpha to unit. And then at the very end of type checking, we have to figure out something for alpha. So let's see actually what type GHC assigns to G. Um, well, in this case, it assigns this type B arrow unit. Well, that I guess that makes sense. We say, well, we don't know what alpha is going to be. And I said it had to be monomorphic, but I guess I didn't really mean that. I just meant that it, did, it had to be unconstrained. And here, the reason that we can get away with this is that is that at this point, but wait, we know beta is really int by now because we've seen x2, right? So this x2 tells us that x is really int. And so that means that actually our wanted constraint is not c of beta alpha. It's just c of int alpha. And lo and behold, right here, we have an instance that has just that shape. Oh, um, uh, uh, can everything be on the screen at once? Yes, I can. Look at that. So, so here we have this instance. We want to solve this. And then the instance solves this constraint. And now we are free. Uh, we are free to generalize. Gen can I spell? Generalize G to have type for all, uh, I guess, G she chooses B for unknown reasons. For all B, B arrow unit. And that's what we see. 
The critical step here was that we knew that beta was int. What if we don't know that beta is int? We don't know that beta is int if x2 comes after g. Let's reload. Still succeeds. Let's see, what is the type of g now? Oh, ghc.types.any. So ghc.types.any is a deep dark secret in ghc, which is when it has a variable, like, it, like the alpha in this case, that it can't quantify over. We can't say for all a, because then we're not going to be able to satisfy this C constraint. Um, uh, if we can't quantify over it, and we don't know what it should be, and defaulting doesn't make any sense, it just chooses this internal type any. Every time any appears in a type signature, that's a bug in GHC, in my opinion. Um, so. Uh, but we can actually even go a step further. So down here in GHCI, I've been using colon T to ask for the type, but actually colon T does some, you know, funny business under the hood. If I use colon I, we really see the type that, G, that GHC infers. Oh, that surprises me. I was expecting to see something else. Well, let's not get too deep into that. Um, uh, I, was ex I was expecting it to have a constraint here uh, for C int A, uh, C int any, even though that constraint is solvable, but but maybe there's some other pass that fixes that. Um, let's not go there. Um, this has consequences though, and not just consequences in GHCI. If I have X3 down here, um, which has a rather boring type, but it calls G at two different typed arguments. This is a bool, this is a car. And so if G is fixed to one particular type, then this won't work. If G is generalized, then it will work. And so if I reload right now where X2 is down here, then I get cannot match bool with car. And that's because this G true finally tells GHC, oh, this Y here, that really should have been a bool all along. Aha. Uh, except that it fails right away. But this same program, if I just move the x2 up here and do nothing else and reload, now the program is accepted. And that's because when we're type checking g, we know that this c constraint is really has an int here, which we, means we can solve it right away, which means that the type, the inferred type of g is not going to be constrained, which means that the monomorphism restriction has no effect. And it means that g can be, can have a polymorphic type to be used in x3. So this just sort of boggles my mind, right? Because because we, we were taught right at the beginning that Haskell is this beautiful language where order just doesn't matter. You can write the order, write your definitions in your file in whatever order appeals to you most. But it's all a dirty lie. And it doesn't even take very much to show it. We really, oh, this extended default rules. That had nothing to do with anything we saw. I should have deleted that a long time ago. I promise you that it had nothing to do with anything we saw. It's just flexible instances. It's something that's been around forever and that many, many Haskellers say this is just a very innocent extension. But now it does some strange, strange things. So this is filed as a bug against GHC. Um, one possibility is that if this x here, maybe we should default x before looking at its use sites, except that that'll break real programs. I don't know if that's quite worth doing. So I don't really know what the solution to this is. Usually we have some idea, but this is a tough one. Um, and it's just so easy to trigger. Um, anyway, I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.